speaking of all of that, I'm going to revert back to, I'm a teacher, so I'm going to use uh, the screen and some chalk and see how we do. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking Mats for inviting me. I came from Los Angeles. It's a complete brain and time warp to come to Sweden. Flying over Sweden, as I looked down, I saw water and trees. And I thought, where are the people? And I realized that people had enough sense to leave the water and trees alone here and there. In America, if it's there, we'll screw with it, we'll play with it, and it won't work, and we'll just move on to the next one because we've got a lot of space to play with. So um, that's the culture I come from. I wanted to comment on a couple of things that uh, were talked about before. I'm a teacher, and I also do research in the, in the evolution and the neuroscience of metaphor. And I'm going to do a little workshop in the break to show you how you, you can use metaphor to bridge this gap. Uh, you're calling it a communication gap. I see it also as a behavioral gap and a goal-setting gap. And very often you can go that way and move back to the language. So uh, Vincent, Vincent made some very interesting uh, comments about how these things can be transitioned into projects. And I happen to have had a, a studio at Arizona State University where I had a student who did this. He was supposed to do architecture, but he really wanted to do fashion. So I said, why don't we just shrink the architecture to the body? And we did this, and we came up with a lot of interesting problems because what he wanted to do was, in effect, make a skin that would regulate the body thermally while he exercised. That is to say, it had to do contradictory things. It had to thermally protect him and yet allow perspiration to evaporate, which is the way he controlled his bodily temperature. We never found a fabric to do it, but here it was. I saw it today. The other thing we tried to do was to deal with it mechanically. That is to say, if he had an internal injury of some kind, a bone or a muscle, that the material could be made to squeeze and hold it in place like a splint. But if he had a blood injury, it had to sort of heal that wound. And again, I saw the material up there on the screen. So we'd have had a lot more interesting presentation if we'd known a lot more about what you're all doing here today. Um, the second thing was this thing about the trees, and I'll talk a little bit about how metaphor can help bridge this communication gap. Because if you look at these trees, you could come up with a metaphor that begins to make how they operate very obvious. They're giant pumps, and there are millions of them, and they pump all kinds of different things. Gases, materials, they communicate with one another, they communicate parts of the environment at different levels. So the trees are really pumping systems. And you begin to think about them that way, you start to think about other things you could make them do, that you could incorporate not only the materials from them, but incorporate materials into them that might augment and extend what they already do. So again, the things that are coming through today, we can start thinking about them right away today. And that's very much what I believe in, is trying to find a way. I'm a, I, I teach architecture, I teach design, and I teach media and communications. And my big thing is to put ideas to work as you're getting them. Don't wait until you've finished and rounded it out and you know exactly what you want to do. But the only way that the design community and the scientific community can work well together is if they collaborate in both process and goal setting. And there are techniques to do this that I've really kind of dedicated my life to doing. And a third kind of reference is to the peanuts, the little packing materials, is that Mott's has provided bags and bags of them. So for those of you that want to play with them, and we're going to have some projects where we use these, um, we'll try to do that. Uh, the detail thing I want to talk about today is a project that I helped put together um, between two institutions in California. One is the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. I don't know if you know of it, but in the United States, it was at one time considered absolutely the best art school in America. It's had some bumps and grinds lately, but hopefully it will come back. But I set up a collaborative uh, project between Art Center and the California Institute of Technology, or Caltech, which is sort of to America what this institution here is to Sweden. Um, it's about one-tenth the size of MIT and produces twice as many Nobel Prizes and that sort of thing. It's very interesting because it's not a modest institution in any way. But they uh, got a new president, another Nobel Prize winner by the name of David Baltimore. And I had a series of meetings with him in the head of Art Center trying to say, let's get together. They had been trying to do it for decades. And all that resulted from those were cocktail parties and art openings. 
Uh, and although that's wonderful, and I have nothing against either one, it was hard to sort of move on or move that into some other sort of collaborative venture. So I got together with, uh, I, I got together with all the board. Uh, uh, Baltimore said, sure, come on over and play. So I went over with the head of Art Center, and Baltimore had the heads of all of his divisions. There were 13 of them. And he opened by saying, well, anybody in the world could see why an art center place would want to collaborate with us. But we want to know why we should collaborate with you. Well, in fact, everybody at Art Center was terrified at the idea of collab collaborating with Caltech because they'd had some experience with the computing science division and some of the physicists over there and things like that. And, and successful scientists can be a little condescending to people that don't actually know what they're confronted with. So he said to me, I would like you to demonstrate um, why we should be involved with you. I said, okay, that's fine. That's a fair question. I said, well, to start with, I will grant that Caltech, the professors here are masters of the algorithm. No question at all. It's a math school, and Caltech really is. And so I said, that's fair. I said, on the other hand, we at Art Center are masters of the metaphor and metaphor rules. Well, <laughs> David, if you know anything about him, rose to the occasion. I said, that's very interesting, Mr. Dobry. Um, I would like you to go around, and each of the division chairs will give you an example in their field, and I would like you to give the metaphor that solved the problem for them. Well, I got away with it until I came back to David Baltimore, who said, yes, well, what's the metaphor for the genome? <laughs> And I failed. <laughs> I said, gee, that, I'm going to have to think about that. I got it later, but you know, the dramatic moment had gone. But the upshot of this was he said, well, the keys, the keys of Caltech are yours. Good, good luck at finding the right doors. So I spent several years doing that. The first project we put together is the one I want to talk about. It was a project that was begun in 2000, and it involved myself and the head of the engineering science department, which is half of Caltech, a man by the name of uh, Richard Murray, who was a Berkeley grad, and so was I, so we had some serious bonding there. I was originally a physicist, and then I did film, so I kind of knew both sides of the track. And we got together, and we applied to the National Science Foundation, which in America is our chief government funding agency. And the, Amer and the uh, and National Science Foundation gave us $600,000 against the idea that we raise another million dollars to provide and sustain what's called an entrepreneurial fellowship program. The idea of the entrepreneurial fellowship program is that Murray and I, and then our respective faculties, would get together and set up a program to facilitate designers and scientists, students who'd actually graduated, so there was no problem with their getting their degrees, would collaborate under the auspices of um, setting up a business plan. It was very, very interesting. So we had a goal, and the business plan part of it was run by two totally different kinds of people, by the venture capital firm, about two of them, who operated in Los Angeles, and these guys are characters. And the second was the economics division, which was mainly involved in game theory at the time, John Ledyard and that gang. So that was, the, that was the sort of business side. We started interviewing. We had 75 applicants between the two institutions, and we boiled it down to four teams. This is the way we decided to do it. We decided that Caltech and Art Center would co-design the curriculum, and this is where the power was because it was the way the kids would learn. So this is what we decided on doing. 